So as, as I said, the two topics then is the one is is related to some of our physical systems and industries, 4.0 and smart factory, and the other is cloud manufacturing. So uh, sort of have half and half. Um, just the first topic, our first set of topics. Um, I'll just talk about the uh, CPS briefly. Uh, it's probably not uh, new to many of you uh, at all. And Industry 4.0, uh, smart factory concept, uh, industrial internet, which is sort of American sort of uh, way of thinking uh, about Industry 4.0. Um, so to start off, uh, maybe some preamble um, so, sort of background information about why it, it, we're coming to a time that, that we need to think about these different topics and, and, and we need to spend time and effort on this. Well, the first thing is globalization and decentralization. And these days, you don't make things in one place. You, you actually have people helping you out from different parts of the world. And things are, the production systems are decentralized in many ways. Uh, and also we have a data explosion in a way that you can get data easily from almost anywhere. Uh, and so it's it's a good thing that you have data, but, but it's not so good if you don't know how to deal with it and how do you <laughs> manage it and how to analyze it. So that's why uh, data in many cases doesn't equate to information, so you, you really have to analyze it and process the data so that it becomes useful information. So that, that means the data analytics is also important in this sense. And this connectedness and industry of things uh, is also coming our way. I think it's, it's been talked about in, in different contexts, uh, the way that the things are connected, uh, but also the uh, people and the systems are connected. And these are also important. And then if you look at the production system, I think uh, we used to talk about value chain, you know, uh, um, when it comes to production systems. I think now we're looking at not just a, a chain system, but it's actually a network. It's a value network. Things are connected in a more complex fashion, not sort of in a linear fashion. This happens first, and then you go to the next part, next phase. So network is key words here, I think. Um, um, we, we, we just have to... Uh, perhaps refocus a little bit. Now, cyber physical system, I have to be brief on this, and there's probably a lot of e uh, expert here, but what is it? Well, that's, this is perhaps my understanding, if you like. Um, it's about sort of combining the virtual world with the physical world. At least that's how the terminology uh, came about. Uh, it has a focus on connectedness and also with intelligence, so it's, it's no good just connect things together, you hope it works, uh, but, but you really have to introduce intelligence uh, and, and in the whole system. Well, when you communicate between different systems, between different machines here, M2M communication, we have got that in the past. We may say it's not new. Well, it is true and it's not true. Um, but what is new here is we're actually talking about semantic communication. So we, we, we're talking about things can communicate in a meaningful way that people, uh, and systems can understand. Uh, uh, semantics, not just syntax. Uh, so I think that's the key thing there um, <coughs> we're looking at. Um, what people are saying, well, cyber physical system, is it not just embedded system? Well, I think it, it is technical term, it is embedded system, but our people try to focus on closed embedded systems. So embedded systems can be uh, uh, connected with other embedded systems. So it's, it's, a, it's perhaps a, a ecosystem for all the embedded systems, that they work uh, cohesively and in, in a coordinate manner. And this will provide you know, a lot of functionalities. Uh, once you have connected, con uh, connected things together. When it comes to manufacturing, and people try to sort of have a manufacturing version of uh, CPS, and this will be CPPS, Cyber Physical Production System. So this is perhaps more of our focus. But don't forget, Cyber Physical System can be anywhere, can, can in social worlds, can in, in any other uh, uh, walk of life. <coughs> 
Uh, then this industry 4.0 came about. So it's originated from Germany. That's why I keep the German <laughs> spelling of industry there. Uh, I, I guess it's fitting there because uh, <coughs> it does come from Germany. Although when, I was, when we were in Germany, the, the, all the presentation given by our German colleagues, they use proper English uh, spelling there. <laughs> um, well, I think there's this perhaps people talking more about um, factory level uh, industry 4.0 concept. Um, what, what I think the, uh, the way to understand this is that there are two aspects there. Uh, the one is really looking at the consumer, the customers, the users, and the other is looking at the factories that are making products. So really industry 4.0 is about sub-physical physical systems combined with perhaps internet of services that give you smart products. So it is the product that becomes more uh, uh, intelligent, become smart, that, that's used by the customer. So it's, that's on the, the product end, you know, what you're making. Uh, and then on the other side, the factories that are making these components, these systems, these products, they want to be smart as well, and then the way to do that is to actually combine with the smart production processes. Then you have smart factories. So, so I think this is more talked about rather than these aspects. Um, the smart factories can be very smart, but if you don't make smart products, it's no use. It's useless. So I think these two things come together. Uh, so I just got a few examples of this and a couple of examples of, of the other. The, the smart factories as well. So, so these are the two different contexts, don't forget. <coughs> uh, just, well, when we were in uh, Stuttgart, we visited uh, Daimler in Stuttgart, um, visit their factory and, uh, and this, um, uh, we had a talk uh, given by uh, Daimler talking about their vision. Uh, this is their concept car, uh, is they call F015. Uh, was first introduced in, in early this year in uh, Las Vegas. They call it luxury in motion. This is a typical example of smart products that company are, 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 um, are making. Well, the few key aspects that are very interesting. One is really emphasize the, the interaction between passengers and the car itself. So this is in-car communication. So. So this is, again, bringing closer the, uh, the passengers and the car they are in. And the other is interaction between the vehicle and the environments that's around the vehicle. So they had this uh, uh, extended sense sensor system. They try to get data from outside the car, around the car, and then to do some sort of processing and, and analysis. And they're also looking at uh, uh, connections between other vehicles, so, so vehicles talking to vehicles on the road. Uh, uh, so that's, that's another scenario, I think, if you like. So I, I think these are all <coughs> indication of, of product and system being made to actually uh, itself as a sub-physical system, but it's also uh, um, um, related to, to the concept of Industry 4.0. Uh, just uh, another slide about this 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 car here. Uh, I mean, some examples of interaction between vehicles and environments. For example, uh, uh, the car can interact with the pedestrian. If I mean, they, they can have this uh, whole array and matrix of LED displays and just to communicate with the pedestrian. And here they can project a zebra uh, lines there so that pedestrian can travel. So it can cross the roads and, and you know safely and, and can be seen by other people, other car users, other cars, other drivers. So, so this is really trying to uh, communicate with the, with the pedestrian uh, and outside the vehicle. And this is communication with uh, the traffic behind the car which can display different, uh, different signs here. This is, I don't know whether you can see this. This is says slow and this is says stop. So it's not just an indicator, you know, but it can, I don't know whether it can speak, but in this case it's just to display some messages. Uh, again, I would say it's this indication of, of uh, how systems 
are being produced to be able to communicate with people and with other systems. So I think they all come under the same umbrella of sub-physical system as Industry 4.0. Well, there's a lot of uh, articles around this concept car. You can go online and have a look. So I, I think um, I won't go so and talk about this aspect of smart products. I'll just focus on the other side, which is production systems and how uh, we can actually use the technology to, to really build a, a smart factory uh, based on uh, CPS and, and other t similar technologies. Well, there's no need to sort of go into details of this diagram. If anybody knows four point, Industry 4.0 will understand this diagram. Well, what it says is, is really, this is coming out of Germany, Germany, of course, really looking at the, how industry has evolved through different stages, driven by different technologies at different time. And so this is driven by, uh, by water and steam power system. This is Second stage revolution is driven by electrically powered uh, systems, and, um, and then we have this IT-driven industry, and then this is uh, industrial revolution based on CPS. I think uh, if, if this is IT-assisted periods, and this will be IT-driven or IT-centered um, uh, 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 industrial revolution. <coughs> well. You can debate about whether it's a four stage, four revolutions, or three revolutions, or even five. Well, I think that's probably not the, the key thing here. But if you think about the, the progression, the four phases there, as, as we've seen. Um, and then when you look at our society now, uh, you can probably uh, understand why we are at this uh, stage at this point of in time that we need to think about cyber physical systems. Well, really, uh, digitization of e economic and social processes happened quite a few years ago. You know, um, this this is what I consider the first wave. It started since the nineteen eighties. I mean, things like uh, banking systems and consultings and publishing. You know. And, you can do things online for banking and for a long time. You don't have to go to the library to, to get a paper to read. You can just go, go online <laughs> as a digital version. So I think this has happened already. But this is, remember, is really on the social process and economic side of this. And, and uh, what we are seeing now is, is perhaps a second wave, which is really looking at physical systems being made uh, addressable over the internet. And so so the, it, it is a natural progression, the way I see this. And it is the time that we actually look at the physical systems and how we can make it cyber ready and internet addressable and so they can communicate with each other. So if you look at the whole landscape of digitization of different things, it, it is the time that we we, we are looking at these, these uh, issues. Um, well, smart factory is actually what we really need in the end. It doesn't matter what terminology, what technology you, you, you're using, the cyber physical systems, Industry 4.0, it doesn't really matter. What I need is I need a smart factory uh, which can actually uh, do things uh, autonomously, for example, and it's, it's perhaps not just the ICT-based control, but also uh, the, the components, machines, and uh, service robots, and these these different elements of a production system can also communicate meaningfully and uh, uh, and can act accordingly and autonomously. So it is actually another level uh, further uh, over this ICT-based control. And because you can sort of uh, it, it can have this autonomous acting sort of uh, uh, feature there, it will be easy to optimize the system for individualized um, products. So this is where we're going. And it's also easy to actually um, reconfigure your system and, and also easy to communicate with other resources outside <coughs> your factory. You know, it, you might need to have some resources from a different country. And so, so this is why cloud manufacturing comes in here 
uh, uh, really trying to bring resources on a global scale. And if you do this, you have very efficient resource utilization. And sustainable is another key word here, and then service oriented practice. Uh, that's, that's also important because I think increasingly, this is another sort of key words I want to emphasize. We, we increasingly uh, moving into service oriented system and products. And so I'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Again, this is borrowed from uh, a, a document from Germany. It's just illustrates the smart factory concept. I mean, as, as I talk about this, it's about smart machines which can communicate in, 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 a, in an intelligent way. And uh, then they form what we call uh, cyber physical production systems. <coughs> And then factories and factories, they are also interconnected. That's actually quite important. Uh, and so, so making sure this is not, not sort of isolated and self-enclosed uh, system or factory. Uh, and these different smart factories can actually uh, operate over a cloud network uh, and so that uh, resources can be shared and uh, enterprises, virtual enterprises can be formed. Uh, so, so that's, I think this is a good diagram to sort of <coughs> segue from cyber physical system to, to the cloud-based technology, if you like. Now I mentioned about the, the American way of interpreting all of this. Um, and very often they, they have a, a different focus and different view of, of what we are talking about. Well, they, they, they're not using the words cyber physical system that much. They're not using the words industry 4.0 that much in the US. Um, but it's, it's actually uh, driven by some major uh, businesses and major companies in the US. In this case, it's a GE. Uh, they, uh, they actually started looking at this issue quite a long time ago. Uh, so the term they're using is industrial internet. Well, in my view, it's same thing, you know, Internet of Things, Internet of Industrial Things, and cyber physical systems. Uh, they, they have three focuses there when, when it comes to industrial Internet. It's is the machine that's being made intelligent. Well, that's not new. It's the same as the machines in the uh, 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 Industry 4.0. Uh, advanced anal analytics, this is about processing data. That's not new either. Uh, people at work and they really emphasize this aspect, I think it's important that, uh, I think it's quite fitting here that to really not to forget about uh, the workers on the shop floor, uh, the people who are using the system. So the three aspects, they're, they're looking at this. Uh, but in, in essence, I think it's the same concept as Industry 4.0, so uh, we're not debating which one is which, which one is correct. Uh, they, they don't have four industrial revolutions as, <laughs> as the Germans have. Um, they have three waves. Uh, well, again, I won't go into the detail of this. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. What it matters is at this stage where we are in now, uh, how do we react? What do we need to work on? Okay, so they call it industrial internet. So machine-based analytics, physics-based and deep uh, domain expertise and automated predictives and all these terminologies. I think it's, it's basically Industry 4.0. Well, what's actually more interesting for me, uh, this GE concept, is, is really uh, this prediction from GE. They, they actually work with uh, World Bank, uh, this is very early on in 2011, looking at the potential uh, GDP increase uh, with implementation of industry, uh, in industrial internet. <clears throat> so if you look at the global GDP there, it's 70 uh, trillion, around 70 trillion, and it's split into between developing economies and advanced economies. Um, then for each one of this, uh, there is a non-industry economy sort of contribution and then it's industry economy, so industry economy, non-industry economy, 
So we are interested in this industry economy, of course. That's where we are working in there, and that also has the uh, 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 quite a big uh, share of this um, uh, of this uh, entire GDP map. Um, but if you look at the uh, the industry economies, there's two sort of uh, parts there. One is manufacturing contribution, and the other is others, the rest. And here, manufacturing and the rest. I can see manufacturing actually form the bulk of the GDP contribution. So I think that's very interesting in terms of the experts are predicting about the impact of the technology in manufacturing area. And it, it, I think it is it, it can only be underestimated in my view. So that, that somehow tells me it is, it is the area we need to focus on. It is the manufacturing is this area we need to focus on. So these are two big numbers there if you compare to other the non-industry contributions there. I just want to sort of uh, come back to, to highlight some of the key words. Um, one of them is industry of things. This is really about connecting things together. And this data and data analytics and intelligence come out of your analysis of the data. And autonomy is, is also important. I talk about service, I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. Very important concept, very important concept. I think businesses realize this uh, um, sometimes unknowingly. Uh, smart products is, is the only way that we can sell well of, of whatever you're producing. Uh, the car we talk about, the Mercedes Benz, the concept car, of course, is a good example. Uh, smart factories, uh, you know, talking about Autonomic, auto, uh, autonomics of production, which means it's a very high level sort of intelligence introduced. Um, well, this is perhaps sort of the first lot of topics in the cyber physical system industry 4.0 and, um, uh, um, uh, and, and smart factories. Um, I, now let's just, just move into the second lot, and th these are connected in cloud manufacturing or cloud-based manufacturing, whatever you call them. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's actually, we're talking about a new way to run business, new way to run manufacturing business. Um, I've, as I said, I combined these two talks together, so I've overlooked, the, I, I was just uh, past the first two uh, uh, sections there. And I, uh, I talk about service science. Remember, I talk about service. It's a very important concept in my view. And then I talk about cloud manufacturing. And how do we define that? Uh, I'll give you a couple of ex examples there uh, and then talk about uh, some other aspect of cloud manufacturing. And then, and then I finish off. So this is, if you like, the second lot of the uh, discussion. Uh, well, cloud computing comes out first, of course. So when you talk about cloud manufacturing, the first thing you think about is cloud computing. Uh, the, the key thing in, in cloud computing concept is, is cloud computing services, basically offering things uh, as a service. Uh, you pay as you go. I mean, it's a very important concept. It's probably one of the key concepts why uh, uh, it survives uh, for so long. I think it will continue to survive. So you, you can offer infrastructure as a service and platform and software as a service and so that that's cloud computing service why they, they sort of can't be separated and service science you can see I have a word science behind service and believe or not service is being considered as a science um, this is actually come out of uh, UC Berkeley uh, working with uh, people from IBM uh, so this is, I think, about five or six years ago. Uh, they, they view service science as service science management and engineering, so SSME. Uh, they have this uh, interesting logo there as well. So this is it, a science, it, it, it's a management uh, uh, science, it's, it's engineering as well. So it's, I think uh, they start to offer degree programs on this as well. Well, when we talk about service, uh, we, we know service in the traditional context. Uh, but we can actually 
trace back to this book published by uh, Professor Daniel Bell, really looking at the industry revolution, you know, this is in the 1970s, a long, long time ago. Uh, he, he's talking about what we are going to, to, to sort of experience in terms of the revolution of manufacturing industry. And so he's talking about knowledge-based services will overtake manufacturing. Okay, well, it has happened to some extent. And, and the services in general will, will swamp manufacturing as a, as a source of employment. Now, um, it's, and the key word is service, but I'm, I'm unclear about whether Bell thinks the service here that he's talking, talking about is actually um, another version of manufacturing business, another version of making products, or it is more sort of traditional kind of service concept. Um, but in any, in any case, service is coming our way and we cannot ignore that it is, it is becoming uh, a normality here for not just uh, people like us, but also for businesses, for manufacturing businesses. I mean, if you talk about service, there's a different concept that this is the, uh, the, the service-oriented architecture borrowed from IT industry, of course. So you have service provided and service request, uh, and the important thing here is the service register, of course. You, 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 if you want to coordinate services in, in a proper way, then provide better service to the requester. And uh, this is important. And, and car manufacturing, to a certain extent, utilizes the, the similar concept. So I think uh, it is uh, quite clear that manufacturing businesses are being transformed from product production and physical system oriented business into service oriented business. So I think businesses are, not, are no longer just producing a physical product and then sell to customer, then they forget about it. Uh, it is not happening that way anymore. They're selling a solution to the customer. And that solution has got the actual product, but also service elements perhaps, uh, solution elements in there, so it's a complete package uh, and the, the manufacturer will try to still keep the connection with the user that are using their system. <coughs> well, there are many, many examples there. Uh, in, in my university, you know, we have staff common room like your common room here. Our coffee machine, we do not own the co coffee machine. We, don't, we didn't buy a coffee machine. We buy the service. So we say, look, we want to, you know, have a, a coffee serving uh, um, site and, and we have so many people there wanting uh, you know using the service and so so we basically they come and put a coffee maker there they come and top up top, uh, coffee beans if there's a problem they come and fix it if there's a new version of the coffee machine they will come and replace it we are buying a solution a service we are not buying that physical machine so it is changing and many, many examples there. <clears throat> so this is important service oriented kind of uh, concept. So, so if you look at this is a sort of very conceptual level of understanding about uh, a product. If you're making a product, if you look at which part of the products that's giving revenue to you. So the revenue uh, resource is 100%. You're setting the product or service for that much of uh, uh, cost. Um, and the product itself may have some hardware components. For example, if it's a car, of course, the car itself is, is hardware-based systems and products. Uh, and then you have software-based kind of elements in there. There's intangible services and analysis and monitoring capabilities there. And so I think the trend here is in early days, you know, early days, you can actually sell a product at a good price with very little software components there. I mean, as long as, as, long as you make a brilliant machine tools and you know, can, uh, uh, and people can use them to produce components uh, easily and, and uh, give a good accuracy, that's fine. But increasingly, this software components is, is actually 
uh, overtaking the hardware pass there. Uh, I think that's the trend we are seeing. Um, uh, so really, you have to think about this part here. Whatever you produce, even if it's a car, you have to think about this. I mean, in this case, in, in this, this days, cars have got a lot of electronics and embedded intelligence in the cars. And the good thing for advanced economy to think about this is also because hardware-based things can be easily copied. You can just uh, strip it down and measure that, and then you can reproduce the system. But if it's a software, unless you have unique skills, it's difficult to copy. Uh, it can easily sort of protect your IP in there. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of examples of cars, smartphones, and, and, and you think about it. And the key thing, of course, is, is total integration of these two things. They, they have to come together. So again, that's the thing that we're looking at, and the software-based sort of components really contributing to the service part, rather than the actual thing you're buying. Uh, I just want to give you this uh, example. Uh, this is the electric car coming out of the US, uh, Telsa. You've probably heard of this. Uh, very typical sort of um, a popular electric car in the States. What they call that size app on four wheels. And so this is a good Tesla. example. Sorry? Tesla. Tesla. Oh, Tesla, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, really looking at uh, sort of providing a service to, to the people, not just a, a, a vehicle to, to get you from A to B. Uh, so they have sort of advanced diagnosis systems and uh, uh, monitoring systems as well. Another example is smartphone. Uh, these days, uh, this is coming out of the uh, New Zealand uh, web page. You can buy a smartphone for zero dollars, so you don't pay anything for the actual physical product. And you pay for the plan, of course. You pay for whatever plan that you, you want to buy it with. One extreme, okay, so the actual physical components is zero, worth zero, worth nothing. Uh, and you have to buy the service. And they, they come together, so that means you can't have one without the other. I mean, you might say, look, I just want the phone to use as a camera. <laughs> I don't want to use it as a phone. Well, that's, that's fine, but that's probably not what the, uh, the, the customer initially designed for. Um, well, so, so that's service aspect of this manufacturing. And then, uh, how do we define cloud manufacturing um, in, in this context? Well, this is my, my definition. Um, it's, it's published in, in this paper in 2012. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we're really looking at sort of utilizing cloud computing sort of concept. It, it, it's basically uh, looking at a network access to a pool of manufacturing resources. Now, we're actually generalizing manufacturing resources in, in, in a broader way, things like Software can be part of the service, and equipment, capabilities, and anything else that you can treat, you, you can actually uh, um, sort of offer to other people. And these services um, will be, can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimum management efforts. So it's looking at uh, uh, capturing different manufacturing services and offer that to the customer. So the, that, that's the uh, concept. Um, just a couple of examples there. Um, manufacturing involves design. So uh, design is also considered as, a, as key components of manufacturing business. But design software um, it is, it has been sort of, uh, sort of making the, the headway there, uh, uh, offering as a service. This is what I call low-hanging fruits for uh, cloud technology. Well, uh, there's different CAD systems out there. So Autodesk is one of the early ones still around. Um, they are the first uh, people offering software as a service. This is a design platform as a service, uh, PaaS. So, so what they've done is they uh, you can actually purchase their service online without having to buy annual license, uh, whatever. So, so the different uh, 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 fleet of their products is the product lifecycle management, 
simulation package and fusion uh, for 3D direct modeling and uh, computer aided manufacturing as well. So it's basically it's a pay as you go model that software companies are offering. Uh, there's a lot of benefits of doing that. You, you don't have to invest good computers in your company. Uh, uh, you don't have to manage your licenses. You don't pay annual license. Uh, once you have updates, you don't need to sort of go and physically update yourself and because the, the, the server will update for you. So there's a lot of uh, benefits there and um, they offer different uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, different type of uh, services there. And if you look at the, uh, the cost benefit here, um, you pay just under seven thousand US dollars for 120 jobs. And if you do, if you pay annual license, traditionally that's how much you pay for one year plus the maintenance fee there. So it works out. Um, if you only if you only do once or twice, you use once or twice a week. There are systems you, you, you're much better off to use that pay-as-you-go model. Unless you say you probably use twice or three times a day and 365 days in a year and then probably you pay that annual license that will probably uh, uh, come out on top in terms of uh, uh, saving, saving a software cost. So, so um, it depends, still depends, but I think um, attractions are here. Uh, in, in, in our university, Situation: we, we we use different packages for our courses, and we, we only run our courses in two, one or two semesters. And even in one semester, we only use perhaps a particular software for three weeks, for example. We don't need an annual license. We only need license. We only need to pay for three weeks of use. So this is actually quite useful for us as well. For normal businesses, maybe it's not the case, uh, but but it must be. Uh, th th there will be benefit if it's not heavily used, of course. Well, that's on the software side. This is more sort of on the industrial system side. This is the project that we, we've been working with uh, um, a research institute from uh, Stuttgart in Germany. And so we're looking at um, the industrial systems. In this case, these are machine tools. How we can utilize these resources in the cloud to support multiple systems uh, in the factory. Uh, so, so things you might want to do such as you know, PLC control, uh, robot control, motion control and collision detections, and CNC of course as well. Now the, what, the way uh, it, it may work is, is, is like this. <coughs> We're looking at cloud-based control uh, as a service. Um, so what we have at the moment is if you're controlling an industrial system, um, you have fairly sort of complicated computational parts plus the process parts sort of combined together in the local resources. Maybe it's packaged in a controller on your machine tool, for example. <coughs> um, and very often this computational part has got IP there, it has, you know, has got a internal uh, uh, intellectual property embedded in there, uh, which is probably has more value than just the process part, which is basically uh, a very low level uh, um, data to communicate with hardware to realize whatever you have uh, uh, calculated and, and processed. So, the, so what we're looking at is, is can we actually move this out of this local resources uh, to have it in a cloud, uh, then this can be uh, this can serve other systems, and of course you have to have some way of communicating with other systems. In this case, you want to communicate with multiple machine tools, for example. So, uh, and once you you can do that, then you can offer your service in a cloud to different systems. Now. Uh, there are still technical issues that we're working on, of course, and how do you make this happen? Uh, uh, of course, you can't have real-time control through the, uh, through the Internet at the moment. Uh, 
<coughs> and so the real, really the scenario is, is to have some sort of platform here as a flexible control platform. Then you have plugins for factory uh, functionalities, whatever you want to do. You want to simulations, uh, HMI, and uh, manufacturing execution systems, and ERPs, and, and others. Uh, so, so the, the idea is is offering a cloud-based platform that house different services, and then you can plug in and so uh, coordinate different services. So, it's a platform as a service the way I see that. Now, um, we we've been working on this for some time. Um, but really, w what is the, the, the catch for industry? And when you go, go out and talk to people from industry, uh, uh, what do you talk to them? Well, there are two different groups, I think. There will be, there will be one group that actually ask, uh, asking for services. Uh, and and the, the cloud-based technology will, will serve well for these people. Because it's, you don't have to invest yourself for you, uh, and if you can use other, other people's service. So shifting the capital expenses to operational expenses. And business become more agile as well. And you can have access to, to innovation uh, in, 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 in a quick, quick way. Uh, for businesses that has got unique services that they can offer or spare services, capabilities that they can offer, there's also a lot of benefits. Uh, they, have, they can have access to a large pool of customers if they have it in the cloud. Uh, they can improve productivity. This is a better utilization of the resources if you define uh, productivity in that sense. Uh, and business is more agile as, as well. Uh, well, there are actually quite a few things that, that industry has to um, look at before they they embark on this type of system. First of all, the data has to be uh, sourceable from, uh, uh, from different uh, places. And so this is from hardware. So it has to be cloud ready because these days, businesses have their legacy systems which doesn't communicate well with other outside worlds. So how do you make sure that the, the legacy, legacy systems can actually uh, uh, give you the data that you need? So so this is a lot of work going on at the moment. So I was, uh, we were in Germany and visiting um, um, Technical University uh, Chemnitz, and they actually looking at retrofitting a machine tool which is 30, 40 years old, and how do you actually put in some simple sensors and get some data out so you can do some communication. So that's important. The first thing you have to do, of course, uh, and then, of course, the uh, connectivity as well. So it's, it's, not just, it's not just enough just getting data from a system, but also you want to have systems communicating with each other and talk to each other. <coughs> and I talk about data. You have just too much data. And how do you actually process it and make sure that you have useful information from that? Uh, a business may have different resources, and they may need resources from other people, but they also may offer resources to others. And, and they may want to have, they might, may want to decide what services they want to keep in house and what other services they can offer to, to other users. So that's actually a fairly uh, sort of business st strategic decision that the that, that company uh, has to make. Uh, and then resources can be offered in a very tight sort of private cloud environment. It can be uh, offered in a community cloud and or public cloud. So there's a different options there as well. So businesses need to think about it. I think we're coming to the end now. Now again, we're looking at very similar structure as the uh, uh, service-oriented architecture there. Here is the... Um, <coughs> Here is the user of the services. This is this is service providers. So we are looking at developing some sort of uh, cloud management system which can actually register the services, and the user will request services from from the cloud. Uh, you may ask, what, what what do you mean by manufacturing services? 
well, what are the so resources that you can actually capitalize, you can actually capture and offer as a service. Well, in real sense, anything that happens in the factory can be a, a service. Uh, can be real resources related things like soft resources, and software knowledge, hard, hard resources as well, this is manufacturing resources or whatever, and, and capabilities, this is sort of uh, at a higher level uh, in terms of what, what company can offer. And of course, uh, these are all interconnected. And I think what's more important here is, is these capabilities, when, when these are captured as a service, which has more meaningful uh, sort of uh, uh, appeal, uh, appeal to, to the customers. Rather than just offering a machine tool, here we go, uh, you can use the machine tools, but what's important is actually uh, package them, uh, uh, offering as a service. Um, I think uh, we're running out of time here. I just want to give you one example here. This is a European Union project funded uh, by a European Commission that's finished in 2013. Um, so it's, it's perhaps the first project that European Union, European Commission funded. So this is looking at manufacturing as a service. So, it, so it's developed this manual cloud which interact with the manufacturers, uh, getting the services organized here, and the user will interact with the manual clouds, not interacting with the uh, factories directly. So. I just uh, sort of quickly show this. <coughs> um, I think I just finished off with a few uh, concluding remarks, and I can take on some questions. Well, cloud computing changes the way the manufacturing enterprises do business. I think that's what I want to say. Um, well, this cloud computing or cloud technology. I think should also include cyber-physical system concept. Um, it's important really address issues from the industry perspective, and so we need to address the real needs of industry rather than talking <coughs> about something that sounds good, but but business have no interest. They don't want to do, don't have, want to have a bar of office. Well, a few things that's that's key for car manufacturing or if you like, Industry 4.0. Data, data connectivity, and I talk about this repeated a few times. And data process analytics and synthesis as well. And cyber physical system, of course, and Industry 4.0. And smart factories. Well, the, the, the cloud concept for manufacturing, I think, is, is quite sort of unique in a way for uh, countries with many small, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. This is only true for New Zealand, because the government is looking at uh, sort of setting up a New Zealand incorporate model, meaning we we are a big manufacturing company in New Zealand. <laughs> Let's come together and how we utilize the expertise the the, uh, the different businesses have, so that we can compete. So it's really sort of uh, uh, coordinating resources in, in, in a way. Uh, so the resource providers is and the resource users, win-win situation there as well. And if you can coordinate these different resources together, you basically you can form some sort of virtual enterprise so you, you have more capabilities to compete with other people. You have ability to take on bigger projects as well rather than individual small businesses going out and you know trying to talk to the big players. So I think that's me. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.